Hi friends, thanks so much for joining us tonight for this new initiative of the Soren Fellows Program, the Integritas Forum. These interview-style conversations, which will occur once a month throughout the academic year, are intended to provide you, our Soren Fellows, with opportunities to hear from and engage with successful professionals across a wide range of sectors, be it business, medicine, law, policy, finance, etc., about their experiences and reflections on maintaining personal and ethical integrity across their personal, professional, and faith lives. These conversations will range from considerations on work-life balance, personal discernment and family life, and practical insight about growing in the faith. The inspiration for this recurring event is really twofold. First, at the Soren Fellows Program, we always seek to elevate the relational character of your formation and resist the characteristic paradigm of a transactional nature of education that is so common in universities today. These conversations are intended to allow you to learn and know about someone in narrative rather than learn just some simple set of abstract ideas apart from personal narrative. And second, as you well know, the De Nicola Center is proudly a scholarly center at a research university. But at the same time, we recognize that the majority of our Soren Fellows who we get to form and engage here on campus won't necessarily have careers bound to the university or academia. Rather, you'll be scattered across public and private enterprises in finance, in engineering, in law, in policy, in business, and the like. Many of you will also be moms or dads, husbands or wives, good friends and counselors, perhaps clergy or vowed religious. In the relational spirit of the Center and the Soren Fellows Program, we hope these conversations provide you opportunities to glean both practical advice and enduring insights from persons who display virtues of truly integral human formation. Whether, or, whether they work in the field in which you plan to enter, have a similar vocational path that you anticipate, or not. Now, of course, under normal circumstances, these conversations would best take place over Rocco's Pizza and LaCroix which we plan on doing once our shared life together regains some normalcy. But in the interim, we'll host these over Zoom, which I hope provides you the opportunity to engage them on your own time and fruitfully sometime on campus, whether walking to class or perhaps a stroll around the lakes. I've interviewed one-on-one -on -one our guest tonight for about 20 to 30 minutes, with topics ranging from personal discernment in family life to professional development and everything in between. After that, we'll have a live Q&A with our guest, which will last about 20 minutes or so, so we encourage you to stick around, type your questions into the chat function, and we'll be glad to respond to them as we're able. And now it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's guest. Dan Farrell is the Group Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Specialty Care, the United States leading provider of perfusion and intraoperative neuromonitoring services and other critical support areas working with more than 1,100 hospitals and over 13,000 physicians. Dan's experience spans leading sales teams, growing brand equity, initiating and leading strategic initiatives, maximizing profitability, and so on. He has a unique blend of experiences, managing the development and execution of strategic roadmaps, financial models, and marketing strategies across a variety of organizations. Previous to specialty care, Dan served as the chief operating officer at a technology startup, Venley, and prior to that role, Dan spent nine years as vice president of marketing at Press Ganey Associates. In that role, he helped double the company's market share of all U.S. hospitals and established Press Ganey as the clear leader in patient experience improvement. Dan began his career at Kraft Foods after serving four years as a captain in the U.S. Army. Dan earned his MBA from Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management, but most importantly to us, Dan earned his BA in Business Administration from Notre Dame, where he also served in the Army ROTC, as well as as a wideout on the varsity football team. As a reminder, Dan will join us for a live Q&A right after our conversation, so stick around. Well, Dan, thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight. Really appreciate it. Hey, Pete. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Where's home for you right now? What are you doing professionally? And you're a husband and a father. Tell us a little bit about your, your family life. Yeah, you bet. Um, I actually live right here in South Bend, Indiana. Um, I have uh, a beautiful wife, Petra, uh, totally outkicked my coverage, uh, as, as they <laughs> say, uh, with, with her. I don't know how I convinced her to, uh, to marry me, but have uh, five awesome kids. Um, actually just dropped the oldest one off here at Notre Dame uh, just today. Uh, gave him the, the old high five, pat on the back and said, 
one down, four to go. Uh, <laughs> so we are, uh, we're, we, we really love it here. Um, and uh, just then uh, uh, professionally, um, I work for a company that's based out of Nashville. Um, I run their sales and marketing organization. Um, we do specialized staffing for operating rooms. So hard to find folks that uh, do some critical jobs in the operating room. We help hospitals uh, efficiently find those folks uh, and, and drive better quality. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm going to second your out kicking the coverage. It's a good habit to get into. So, Dan, you're you're a domer. Um, you know, one of the questions that I love to ask Soren fellows when they're interviewing to become part of the program is like, what drew you to Notre Dame? Like I, I tell these students, like, look, if you're getting into Notre Dame, St. Mary's, Holy Cross, like you're a good student and you've got you've got options. And some of those options are going to be maybe cheaper or maybe more beneficial professionally. Um, you know, what about Notre Dame makes it so distinctive that draws students to it? I love their answers and I'd love to hear what, what you have to say in, in your experience. Yeah, well, I'm really not sure I had a choice um, going into it. Uh, I grew up in Pensacola, Florida at the back bar at McGuire's Irish Pub watching Tony Rice and Rocket Ishmael run, run touchdowns <laughs> back uh, after kickoff. So uh, my dad went to Notre Dame, my sister went there. So it's kind of a family tradition, but, you know, kind of looking at hindsight, you know, Lou Holt said it best, you know, Notre Dame is not a, uh, a four-year decision, it's a 40-year decision. And, and it's really kind of played that way for me. I look at it three different buckets. You know, the, the first is kind of the faith formation. Um, you know, I can remember the first Sunday I was in the dorm by myself thinking like, freedom's great. Don't have to go to church. This is awesome. Uh, 10 o'clock at night comes around and a couple underclassmen said, hey boys, time to go to church. Um, and I knew at that point, that, that point I, was, I was at the right place. Um, the second bucket for me, and, and the students listen to this know, uh, is the friendships you'll make now um, last a lifetime. Uh, just with a, a buddy who was also dropping a kid off at school, um, and it was like we were we were back at, at, at school. So th those and, and those will last you a lifetime, not only from you know an accountability standpoint to you know your faith life, your family life, but also work life as well. You'll see these these folks in the business world, and 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 there'll be great connections. You know, and and lastly, I'll tell you one of the the biggest thing for me was the Notre Dame brand. Um, you know, as you get out in, in the work world, the Notre Dame brand means something. That moniker is extremely important. Um, you know, in my role, I will have to go in and sell executives um, at hospitals. Um, these are CEOs that have been around the block. Um, and, and I make sure somehow they know I'm associated with the university somehow, that I'm an alumni, whether or not that's a tag on my bag um, or it's something on my business card. And, and the sole reason why I do it is one of two things is going to happen. Either they're going to hate me or they're going to like me. Um, either way, I have a great conversation starter, right? So, you know, if you look at kind of that, that bundle of benefits at Notre Dame, you can't beat it. Yeah, that, I mean, that resonates with me as a domer myself, though, um, maybe not as uh, grizzled in, in experiences as you are. But yeah, when, when you look at kind of the the integrated kind of formation that's possible here through faith, academics, and that professional kind of network that's made available. It's something that maybe is hard to see at times when you're a student kind of living day to day, slogging through, getting up in the dorm, going to, the, going to north or south and going to class and getting through it. Um, but it's something that you kind of can see more in, in retrospect, right? And I'm, I'm about 10 years out from the time that I was an undergrad. And some of the benefits of my time here, I can only see five to 10 years out. I couldn't see it during during my actual time as a student. And it seems to be the case, like when you talk to any alum, that's gonna be their story, right? Is that there are fruits to kind of being here that yeah, you can see when you're on the ground and you're living and breathing the air that's here, but it's actually so much more longitudinal than that, if you can excuse that term, but like the long-term benefits is something that, that you, can, you can carry with you forward, which whether it's professionally or in your faith or hopefully some combination of all those things, it's something that makes this place, I mean, in my mind, and I guess to your measure too, something totally distinct to our peers in the Ivy League or Stanford or, or something like that. So that's, thank you for sharing that. That's, that's yeah, awesome. And, and to tack on to that, I think you're absolutely right. I think the, the, if you think of the value equation in, you know, higher ed right now, right, are the benefits over my price going to be greater than what I could get at a competitor at a different school? That's a great question students should be asking right now. Um, yeah. But I still say that the value, and then we went through this conversation with my oldest, um, the, those benefits still far outweigh 
um, you know, the increased price that you're going to pay to go here. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, yeah, there's something that you can't put a price tag on that is Notre Dame, you know, and uh, that's something worth holding on to. So let's transition a little bit into like what you, what you do now professionally. I mean, you're a senior vice president of a major organization. You know, I think one of the questions that a lot of our students have is like, gosh, that sounds great. And I'd love to be that successful in the eyes of the world, but I don't know how to get from point A as an undergrad in Mendoza or studying econ or whatever to point, you know, C or D, which is where you are now. Like what, what's been your story? How have you gotten from point A to point D? Yeah, it, it's been a story that, you know, I, I would not have written um, because it, you know, took left and right turns. Um, you know, I, I, after going to Notre Dame, um, I was uh, a, uh, an ROC, ROTC student uh, here as well. So my first four years after school was being a, a lieutenant in the Army at Fort Stewart, Georgia, right outside of Savannah. Um, so from there, I had no idea where I was going. Um, you know, it's funny, my, my wife and I, uh, you know, Petra made us made, and I can say that, uh, fill out surveys of where we would be in 5, 10, 15 years. Not even close. Um, you know, I thought I was going to be living in Charlotte, North Carolina, living on Lake Norman, you know, doing logistics. Uh, and so not even close. So, but after getting out of the military, I was super fortunate um, to uh, be picked up to um, uh, be in the brand management program at Kraft Foods. Uh, and, and being a brand manager, you basically have the keys to the car to the brand. Uh, you market it, you sell it, you work with operations, you work with production. It's a great, great experience. Um, so from there, I started thinking about, hey, marketing is a great career. Um, you know, uh, I, I like the business aspect of it. I like the analytics of it. Um, so I started tracking down that, that route. Um, we made a life stage decision and moved to South Bend about 15 years ago. So, and, and really what drove me to that was I like being closer to the customer. Um, brand mm -hmm. management is great. You, you kind of manage from the, the top, but you really don't get to, you know, see customers uh, a ton. So moved to business to business in, in healthcare um, and then did that for 10, uh, 10 or so years and, and really um, cut my teeth in terms of the interaction between sales and marketing and how, uh, how important that is uh, and how you can use both to enhance the, the total picture. Um, and also got involved with uh, private equity at that point as well. Um, had a, a, a wonderful experience uh, working for companies that were owned by private equity. Um, then moved into uh, a startup, um, actually right out of the business school here at Notre Dame. And, and you're talking about, you know, some of those things you should do while you're in your school. Keep continue to network. Um, the professor that started the company um, lives across the street from me, and I most likely could have had, you know, an undergrad. Um, so coming back, um, you know, working with him to, to start a product for, for three or four years was, was great. Uh, then got pulled back into uh, healthcare to uh, help a company uh, uh, grow and kind of transition into growth mode. And, you know, that's where I'm at today. Yeah, I, I think that's so fascinating that, you know, as maybe a junior or a senior, you really want to kind of be as intentional as you can to kind of get the right fit out of college. You know, it seems like such a big decision and almost kind of like life defining, like it sets you on a certain trajectory. And it seems like in certain respects, that's true. Like you want to make good, prudent decisions, but at the same time, you just don't know what zigs and zags are going to come along. And ultimately it seems like it's your kind of flexibility and responsiveness to kind of roll with the punches in some sense, make the best out of unique circumstances and, uh, you know, particular positions or sectors that you're in to kind of begin to carve out a path, but it's not necessarily something that you can manipulate from your junior or senior year in college through the time that you hit your, your 50s and you're in your professional prime or whatever. So there's a kind of, strikes me is that there's a kind of like, you kind of have to not try to control everything and, and let it play out in a sense and just kind of say yes to what's put in front of you. Yeah. And, and I would, I think you're spot on, Pete. And I, I would tack onto that, that, you know, you have to embrace the zig and zag um, yeah. because you're not going to have the ideal job coming out of school. Um, but I'll tell you what, companies look for diversity and thought. Um, so who would have thought a, a junior military officer, you know, a captain in the army getting out, Kraft Foods would want this person to go market to moms with kids ages six to 12. I knew <laughs> nothing about that, uh, but yeah. they like the leadership aspect. They like the diversity of thought. Um, and the only reason I could get that kind of job was embracing some of these really crappy roles I had in the army and, and driving great accomplishments from them. So you have to embrace the zigs and zags and use it as an opportunity. Yeah. And, and that seems like something, I mean, whether people are going to enter into kind of 
finance or consulting, or they're going to get into nonprofit work, or they're going to go into grad school. I mean, this seems like something that kind of more of a, a habit of just a well-formed person than say someone who is just strictly going to kind of enter a particular field. It's just kind of more baked into who you are rather than defining yourself based off of what your particular job is at the time. Right on. Right yeah, on. Totally. So amidst all the zigging and zagging professionally, it's not as though this is the only thing that was happening in your life. I mean, um, you aren't just grinding professionally and nothing else is going on. You have people who you love, relationships are developing. Could you share with us a little bit about kind of just your discernment about a vocation to, to marriage and the family in the context of all this professional growth and navigating your own development, especially for some of our fellows who are thinking about, well, I, I want to be successful and I want to thrive in my profession, but I also know part of me is being called to, to be a husband or a wife or a mom or a dad. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the one thing I would say that is you can do it all. Um, yeah. Don't ever think like you have to give up one for the other. You know, really for, for Petra and I, it, it comes down to having the right priorities and being very deliberate uh, about those priorities, right? You know, we, we look at each other, talk about it often. Um, you know, our, our first and foremost goal is to get each other to heaven, get our kids to heaven, and then put ourselves in a position, you know, to, to do great things for other people. Um, and, and if we keep that, you know, top of mind, um, you know, everything else works out. Um, I will tell you a, a quick story that um, when, when Petra and I were living in Chicago at Kraft Foods, we had two kids living in the city. Um, my commute, I was probably on the road you know, at least two hours a day. And that's if I got up at four in the morning and, and, and got in with no traffic. Um, and, and at one point we looked at each other and said, hey, is this, is this right? You know, is, is this going to be, you know, the, the normal for us that we have two, three hours of unproductive family time with, with you in the car? Um, and at the end of the day, we said no. So we had a choice. We could move to the suburbs, um, continue this great trajectory of a career I had at Kraft Foods, or take a step sideways, maybe even a step back, you know, move to South Bend, take a different job, smaller company, um, and, and see what happens. Um, and so we made the decision for the right reasons. We said, hey, let's move closer to family. Let's, let's have more focused family time. Um, and turns out this company I joined was just bought by private equity. They turned into growth mode. They were looking for a guy like me. Um, and, and we tripled the company three or four times. So at the end of the day, it's, it, it, if you make the decisions for the right reasons, I found in my experience, it all works out okay. Yeah, that's so great to hear. And even, I mean, personally speaking, as a young professional, when you want to calculate your way from, you know, step A to step B to step C, it's more just a matter of having good scaffolding. You know, I guess people would say, like in a Catholic world, good, good virtues are ways of thinking, habits of thinking and praying and acting that like, you don't need to have a formula, it seems, not necessarily to get from point A to point D or C or whatever, but it's just simply a way of approaching certain situations as they come up that you don't need to have the particular answer, but you have a way of approaching them that ultimately kind of has your good and your family's good kind of at the heart of it. Right. You know, I look at it, you know, you have your faith life, your family life, and your work life. Um, in that order, um, have your priorities set that way um, and, and adjust and things, things will work out. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So, you know, I know your family. I, I get to work with your wife. I've been over your home. I've played with your kids. You're a dad to five awesome, amazing kids you know, from, a, from a freshman in college, as you mentioned, to middle school, you know. And I think one of the things that stands out in, 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 the, in the minds of, you know, an undergrad or maybe even a graduate student, Soren Fellow, is like, gosh, well, how do I how do I balance that that well? And how do I kind of approach situations when kind of as you said about Chicago, like, man, should I be spending more time with my kids? Is my work life really getting in the way of my kind of ability to kind of put family first? I mean, do you have any like advice or just pearls of wisdom for our Soren fellows as they kind of like try to think through that in anticipation, not having necessarily lived that out yet, but maybe getting frozen in in a little bit of fear and trepidation about, well, I'm I'm nervous that I can't do it all. So how how do you how do you do it all for you know a, a a big family from a freshman in college to someone in middle school? Yeah, it's a good question. And and you know if you if if I look back and and think through what has helped Petra and I be successful, it's it's sacrifice, right? Um, it, 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 any success in life comes with a a sacrifice, and you have to know what you're sacrificing. And um, and then understand kind of where that's gonna where that's gonna take you. 
Um, if you think about, you know, um, when I went to business school, I did it at night when the kids were asleep. You know, I sacrificed the time watch, binge watching whatever show was on at that point, right? It was taking away my personal time, not anyone else's time, not my faith time, not my family time. So success is always, always take sacrifice. Um, so it's understanding when you come into the, the work world that it, it's not going to be all roses. You're not going to get that perfect job right away. Sacrifice the time to make it happen sacrifice you know you know your 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 sleep time all those things that are easy to give up um that don't impact you know the rest of the more important aspects of your life so i would say you know and and really drive to be accomplishment driven at work um this is one of the things that you know you know beyonce drives me nuts um with with some folks is they're they're okay with the resume reading i was responsible for x y and z um, I'm going to pass that resume right by. I want to see what you did with those responsibilities. So I need to see the accomplishments underneath there. And, and it really doesn't matter what that job was. And kind of back to our earlier point, if that zig and zag is not perfect, but you knocked it out of the park, I'm going to really be interested in, in talking to you. So, um, you know, it, but it all, all takes sacrifice, right? Because it's not exactly what you wanted, um, but you have to sacrifice and, and really do your job great. Thank you. That's, that's awesome. All right, Dan, to, to close it out, you know, as you look back at your undergrad experience, you know, what were some things that were easy to gloss over that maybe as you look back now, you probably shouldn't have glossed over? And what are some things or a thing that you kind of obsessed over that really actually didn't end up being worth the worry? Yeah, great, great question. That's thinking way back too. Um, it was, since I was an ROTC student, um, it was really the easy to gloss over um, kind of interview prep. Um, networking with my peers as well as um, professors, especially professors. I wish I would have talked to way more professors because, you know, looking back at the last 15 years, I could have used them as a resource. I could have used them um, to help me bounce ideas off of, to connect me with other people that they, they know. So I think, you know, that that interview prep, that that networking is, is critical. I also say kind of on the networking side, um, Definitely network, network, network. Um, and when I say that, I mean, you have to do it in, in a real genuine way. Um, you know, the, the last thing I want to see is a form email through LinkedIn that you sent 20 different Notre Dame alumni. It's going to get deleted. However, if there's a genuine interest from a Notre Dame alumni, I will stop what I'm doing and respond to that email and say, hey, I'd love to talk to you. How can I help? Can I put you in contact with somebody? So please be genuine about that network, but networking, but do it. You have to do it. So that's probably something I, I glossed over. Um, obsessed about, you know, one of the things that Lou Holtz drove uh, into our heads was that, you know, um, actually had a great quote. He, he would say that whoever wrote the small stuff um, must have been a loser because it's all about the small stuff. It's all about, um, you know, doing the little things right, which I completely uh, agree with. And I think it's 100 percent necessary. I think, though, that I sacrifice the, the bigger picture for the small stuff. So I think you have to do both. My advice would be to always think about the small stuff, but in the bigger picture of what your organization, what your group is trying to accomplish. Yeah, awesome. It, it makes so much sense. I think even a Catholic point of view, you kind of try to take care of your interior house, make sure that you're rightly ordered, that you're kind of loving and addressing things on the most local level without losing track of that kind of ultimate horizon. You know, it all kind of works itself out so long as you control what you can in a, in a faithful and kind of virtuous way. And the, the chips will fall where the chips will fall. But providence is real. Right. And uh, Absolutely. no matter how much we, we think we can control it, so long as we keep our interior house in order, we're, we're going to be in pretty good shape. So, Dan, final question, and one that we ask Soren fellows from time to time. You're at a De Nicholas Center for Ethics and Culture tailgate in the fall, beautiful September day. You have a chance to crack open a LaCroix with anyone who's ever lived. Who are you opening a cold one with and why? Well, if I'm at a DCEC tailgate, um, it definitely won't be a LaCroix. Um, <laughs> as, as we all know, the, the best adult the adult beverage selection is at the DCEC tailgate. So uh, I got to qualify this answer a, a bit. So um, uh, deceased and living, right? Um, I guess yep, you got it. From. Can you I get two? It. Sure. Can I get, all right. So deceased, it would probably have to be 
my grandfather, um, uh, Grumpy. Grumpy was a uh, um, a Notre, or excuse me, a uh, college football player um, and a college football coach. But he passed away when I was in grade school, so he never really got to see me play. And I would love to sit around at a tailgate and and listen to his stories and also kind of game plan on how the, the Irish are going to take care of business that day. Yeah. So that'd be the, the first one. So someone that is is living, this is this is even harder because at a DC tailgate, you could run into um, William Barr, you could run into the potential next Supreme Court Justice of the United States. So th this list is is pretty pretty stacked. Um, but I will have to tell you, and this is going to be pretty cheesy. I would walk past all of them and go sit down right next to the best looking five three five foot three woman <laughs> named Petra, and and I'd have a conversation with her the rest of the day. So that, that is, that's that is awesome. That is awesome. That is family values in action at the DeNicholas Center for Ethics and Culture, man. <laughs> that is awesome. Dan, thanks so much for taking the time to join us and share your, your wisdom and your practical insight. It's invaluable. And hopefully for our students, just provides a little insight into like what it's like to navigate the real world after Notre Dame while, you know, at the same time, just trying to be intentional about the faith and live a virtuous good life. So thanks, Dan, for leading the way. I uh, appreciate you having me, Pete. Thanks a bunch. You got it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, friends, for joining us this evening. And hey, Dan, how's it going? Awesome. Awesome. Well, we'll get started with a couple questions that kind of came through based off of our conversation. Um, and hopefully we can get through as many of these as possible. Um, just want to send a quick note to our Soren fellows. Um, Thank you so much. I mean, it's been a crazy day, guys, um, with all the news coming from campus. And so thanks for joining us. Um, hopefully this has been a time to kind of regain some normalcy, get an insight into someone's life beyond campus, beyond everything that's going on right now. So um, just a note of gratitude to all of you um, for, for joining us. So Dan, um, one of the questions that came through was, you know, Obviously, um, your faith impacts how you think about your, your family life and, and all that. And there, there's a foundation to that. Obviously, you say, you know, your, your job is to get each other to heaven and take care of your kids and all that. You know, in, in the business that you're in, um, you know, what, what role does faith have or how does it inform how you think about your role kind of at the intersection of, of the kind of the Christian life and business slash medicinal care? Yeah, great, great question, Pete. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily, um, you know, I don't think you necessarily need to work in a nonprofit or a faith-based organization to have your professional life be informed by your faith. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think this comes in the form of leadership, um, both direct and cross-functional. Uh, a lot of you folks, when, when you get your first job, are going to be, you won't have direct reports. So you'll be leading cross-functional, be influencing your, your peers um, and, and so forth. And, and I think, you know, not to quote Coach Holtz too much, but I think his philosophy uh, around life here is, is pretty applicable. Um, you know, he talks about living by three principles, do the right thing, always do your best and show others you care. And, and I think this is a great formula for thinking about how your faith can inform your pre professional life. So as you're sitting down thinking and thinking through, how do I influence my peers right now? You know, is there a way that I can lead um, that puts my faith life first? Um, so, you know, I guess my advice would be to encourage everybody to creatively think about what it is to serve the church without reducing it to working for the church. Um, it's not always what you do, it's how you do it. And, and we need leaders like you all influencing every sector of society. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. And that speaks so much to kind of, I think, the what we would say, like the universal call to holiness or, or sanctity. It's, it's not kind of cornered within a particular discipline or a particular sector, but we need excellent doctors, excellent lawyers, excellent salesmen who have that interior disposition, who have that right ordering within them to really show how the faith can kind of provide the, the context, provide the social conditions for upholding human dignity, kind of promoting the common good and, and so on. It's not just kind of ghettoized within particular ecclesial ministries or whatever. So that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you. Um, another question came in. So um, the student asked, you know, one of the things that concerns me is kind of being faced with ethical dilemmas in the context of the future workplace. It's easy to think about them, at, you know, in class or whatever and hypothesize about what you would do. But like, how do you think through um, those situations and what's been helpful in navigating them in your experience? 
Yeah, that, that's a, a really good question. Um, you know, I, I think, first of all, you're going to come across ethical situations sooner than you think and sooner than you want. Um, you know, and, and it really comes down in, in my mind to having the courage to do the right thing. It's tough. I mean, if we peel back the onion, you know, we all know what's right um, and wrong. So we have to stay convicted to to our principles. A couple of things, you know, I think about probably in that context would be, you know, prepare for the situation by building your personal brand on ethical behavior. You know, if you think about it, every interaction we have with, you know, anybody in our business setting, in our, in our personal life, our faith life, we're establishing our, our brand by the way we interact with them. Um, so establish yourself in the business world as someone who takes the high road. Um, so when you do need to have a, a corrective conversation with a coworker or a direct report, it, it doesn't come as a surprise, right? Um, you know, it's kind of funny. Some of my teammates call me a Boy Scout. Um, and, you know, it's kind of funny, but and that's great. But at the end of the day, I've built that brand on purpose, right? Um, I'm not going to have a salesperson come to me with a, a deal that crosses the line. They just know not to bring it to me because it's not, it, they know that it's not going to get approved. Um, the other thing I would think about too would probably be around, you know, make sure you keep things factual in these conversations. Um, opinions can lead things sideways very quickly, keep them factual. Uh, and lastly, and probably most importantly, um, I'm not a smart guy. So whenever I enter those conversations, you know, I, I, I say Father Ted's prayer to the Holy Spirit says, you know, come Holy Spirit, need your help. Um, and, and that gets me through it. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Tim. That makes, again, a lot of sense. And I mean, to my measure, you know, is more like a, a basic human Christian intuition. You know, this is its application within a particular business sector, or, you know, a particular professional role. Um, but the uh, the prayer come Holy Spirit can be as equally uttered going into a sales meeting or before your dissertation defense or before a final exam. Um, and uh, one of the things that kind of I, I share with students and that students share with me is like doing it on the on the small things will allow you to do it when it really counts with the like metal level decisions. So yeah, thank you. That's great. Uh, another question from a, a junior in Mendoza. Um, so. What made you decide to go to graduate school? Um, is an MBA or an advanced degree in the business world kind of a ticket required for entry uh, into executive level positions, marketing and finance, things like that? And question of, you know, should I wait a few years, get some experience, then go back to grad school? Or should I just like slog right on through and bang it out? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, to answer the first part, to be honest with you, um, I, I went to grad school because it was too good of an opportunity to pass up. Uh, when I went to Kraft Foods, they they, they said they were going to pay for the entire education. So I was like, I have to do it. I'm in Chicago with two of the best business schools in the country. So uh, I, I'd be stupid not to. Um, that doesn't mean it was easy. And I think I may have portrayed it that way that I just sacrificed personal time in, in the, in the recording you saw, I will tell you that it, it was tough. I mean, we had a one-year-old and a three-year-old um, group meetings on Saturdays, classes almost every night, as, as you guys know how that, that is a tough slog when you're in school. Um, and it put a lot of stress on the family time. And, uh, and Petra, as, as a rock star, she always has helped us guide us through that. So that was, that was great. Um, but in terms of when to go, I, I do have a, a pretty strong opinion about that. Um, I find that those that work for a couple years after undergraduate um, have a much better experience when they go back to grad school. I've had the pleasure of, of recruiting both undergrads and grads, and I ask this question a lot um, because I, I can tell the difference somebody that has gone straight from undergrad to grad school because um, they're very technical but don't really have the real world um, experience to apply to what they learned in grad school. So I think kind of put a little more, more flesh on the bone there, you know, I think that folks that have worked for a couple of years can apply more practical, relevant experience to their graduate experience. And it makes for a much better, um, you know, uh, understanding of the material. Um, and almost equally as important, I find that you have better interaction with your professors. Um, and, and that is really important as you go to grad school, whether that's business school or, 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 or whatever grad school you choose. Um, but what that enables is a really great conversation because they're looking for relevant, timely experience from the business world that they can use in, in their publications, that they can use in, in developing their, their studies. So I think um, that that is another big, big benefit of that. And I think the last part of that question was around, do you need it? Um, 
I would say not necessarily, um, but I will say that it's going to give you a leg up as, as you compete, specifically as you get towards the higher levels of an organization. Um, and, and every industry has its own set of norms of when you need to go back. So I would also kind of use that as, as guidance as well. It could be different in, in brand management than it could be in finance, depending on when you need to go. Yeah, that's that's a great point. I, I can reflect only really on, on my experience. And I went right through from undergrad at Notre Dame to grad school at BC. And as I look back at that, I, I thought it was a great decision. And, and there were good things that, that came from it, honestly and truly, um, not the least of which being employed at the center now. But, um, but there are certain kind of points of maturation that are missed uh, by not going into the workforce that, that I can see that I, so some of my peers at BC had been working in, in higher ed, whether with students or in research and just brought a particular kind of perspective that you can tell kind of gave greater color and definition to what they were talking about and allowed them to engage the content a little bit more fully. Um, so yeah, I, I, I totally agree that it's kind of somewhat discipline and sector specific and it can kind of be determined by your life circumstances as well. But that's kind of in my mind, embracing the zig and the zag again. It's like, you know, there isn't necessarily going to be a formula that you can kind of just slap onto any one situation and say, this is the way it should work. Uh, but rather it's kind of a responsiveness to what the needs are here and now and to embrace kind of the, the unknown or the zig and zag. So yeah, thanks Dan. Absolutely. Um, I think we have time for about one or two more questions. A question came in about parish life and just like, you know, uh, what role that has had kind of for you and your family, um, the benefits of kind of anchoring down in a parish, how you, how you think about that, or kind of what the benefits have been for, for you and your family, just kind of in, in the life of, of faith beyond, beyond work. Yeah, another good question. And I will tell you, um, you know, uh, Petra and I are from Pensacola, Florida. Um, so there's no reason why we should be living in South Bend, Indiana, you know, the snow capital of the Midwest. Uh, and, and what keeps us here is our faith family at St. Joe Parish downtown. Uh, and we, we, I think we experienced this a little later than most. Um, you know, we were uh, faithful churchgoers in the Army and then in Chicago. But we really didn't find uh, a family home um, in terms of a parish until we got to South Bend. And, and I think that has something to do with as your kids start going to uh, the grade school, you can really find um, uh, that family aspect from the grade school all the way through the parish and then as well as, you know, how you hang out socially with, with some of those folks. So I think for us, um, it not only has been, you know, just crucial to uh, the faith formation of Petra and I, but also to our family. Um, and then also for keeping us in South Bend and keeping us in, in a family where, uh, a faith family where we feel super comfortable. Um, and, and I get to play baseball with guys like Pete um, on, on the parish baseball team. Absolutely. Go Porters, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. Well, we're coming up basically to the end of our time. Dan, thank you so much for joining us this evening and sharing a conversation a few days back. Um, friends, Soren Fellows, um, we'll make sure that you can get in touch with Dan. If you have any follow-up questions that might be more suitable over email, just make sure you don't send one of those form emails or else it will get thrown out. Um, so uh, let's follow up on this when we can. Dan, God bless. Thank you so much. Have a, have a great night and uh, go Irish. Great. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Take care.